Hi, I'm Chris Rogers. I'm a professor at Tufts University. Welcome to my shop. I thought I would talk a little bit today about uh, computational thinking in classrooms and where do we see it going over the next 20 years. Currently, we think of, of computational thinking as, as learning basic coding, learning about if statements and for loops and while loops. But I, I'm betting that in 20 years, it's going to be much more about training of how do you take an object and you train it to behave in a way that you want. And so what I want to do is show some ideas that we've been playing with about what does this look like in classrooms, um, where you can actually bring computational thinking into the classroom without a computer, uh, without even electricity, as long as you have a, a charged battery. So the Tufts Center for Engineering Education and Outreach is a uh, 20, 25 year old uh, program at Tufts or center at Tufts, which looks at how students and teachers learn to engineer. So we partner with teachers in various school districts around the world to co-design and test out different ideas, um, both looking at new technologies and looking at new pedagogies and how the two interact. So we have doctoral students both in the education side, understanding how the brain is actually learning these things, and in the engineering side, taking those learning sciences and applying them to develop new tools. And we partner with a number of people in industry uh, to, to try and affect the tools that are landing in the classroom. So our main teaching goals is really to, uh, to get teachers to think about uh, what are we trying to do as teachers. And I would contend that what we're trying to do is take a story we have in our head and put it into the head of the students. So an understanding of, about something, a feeling about something. So how can we move that story from our heads to their heads? One way is we tell them our story. And we do that a lot. That's the standard lecture. Another way is to show them our story. So this could be uh, lab experiments like this famous physics one where we show that a pendulum comes back to where it started. Or we listen to their story and we argue with them and discuss with them until those two stories align. There's no one right way to do it. It's obviously a balance or a combination of all three of these and those balance, that balance is going to change depending on the subject matter, the student, the teacher, etc. But we try and ensure that there is some sort of balance in all these three areas. So to better understand what we wanted to do, we asked uh, over 100 teachers, what, what did they find important? So if you, the way we phrased it is if you had a student come up and say, 10 years ago, I took your class. And the one thing I really took away from your class was X. What would you want X to be? And uh, the results were, you can see, not much around the actual content, only about 14% said the subject area content, but mostly around confidence, uh, critical thinking, love of learning, uh, creativity, collaboration, character values. So you can see that the things that uh, teachers are saying they're finding very important are not necessarily the things that we're actually assessing in any of our uh, state or, or countrywide assessments. So if, if you ask me the same question, I would say the things that I aim to teach both in my college classes or when I'm working with a kindergarten class <clears throat> is first just teaching curiosity. As a, as a child, we all know that curiosity is high. They're continually asking why, but somehow that, that uh, slowly disappears with time. And so can we find ways of bringing that back? Because once the curiosity starts, then... Um, then we can teach them how to find answers to their, their questions, so how to learn on their own. Uh, and then teach them how to reflect on the answers they found. Where, where's the evidence that this answer is indeed a, a viable one? Uh, and then finally, once they're convinced uh, that they found the answer to their original question, how do you transfer that knowledge into new fields? Because that transfer across fields is where the creativity really starts to happen. So for the past 25 years, uh, we've been working with LEGO Education on the development a lot of a, of a number of different uh, platforms. So we started out with the, the uh, RCX, one of the original platforms. And as you can see, even the video is grainy, so you know it's really uh, from a long time ago. This is a video from uh, my class for freshmen, first year students at Tufts, uh, where they had to build robotic animals. And it was a great way to sort of get them to start working in pairs, to understand the limitations of the tool set they were using, uh, and uh, basically to entertain. On the NXT, uh, this is probably the most complicated Lego robot I've ever been involved with. This was a doctoral student at uh, ETH in Switzerland. Uh, what you're looking at is a fruit fly uh, that is glued to a six-axis force sensor. 
It's a little known fact that the fruit fly flies based on optical input. So if we vary the optical input, it'll vary its wing beat pattern. We can pick up the wing beat pattern with a camera and we can essentially therefore use that wing beat pattern to drive the motors on a car. So of course we had to try it with a Lego car. So we have proximity sensors that will pull in uh, the what's happening around it. That'll control the optical input. And you can see Chauncey here, uh, who's the graduate student, showing how the camera is picking up the wing beat behavior of the fruit fly. So indeed, he was able to get to a fruit fly to drive a Lego robot. The, uh, and there, there you can see it. For, for you too, for $8,000, can have a, uh, a f fruit fly driven car. It's not that accurate, but, uh, but it's pretty neat. Then came the so, EV3. This is how, this is how our robot, our robot works. Yeah, works. Yeah. So, so it is, it going, is to, going to scoop up the jelly. Up the jelly. Put it down. Put it down like that. Like that. And then, and then you take, you take another, piece another piece of bread. Of bread. And and you put it. You put it um, right here. Right here. And there you go. There you, you go. You a peanut butter, butter jelly sandwich. Peanut butter jelly sandwich. <laughs> Clearly, you can see. Robots yeah, will take over the world it. in no time. I need, it. I need to eat it. Um, this is part of an experiment that a colleague of mine did called Dr. E's Challenges, where kids from all over the world were, uh, could participate. Uh, they were given a challenge. They would come up with a solution to their challenge, and they would upload it uh, onto Ethan's website. And that there's a whole bunch more of them uh, at dr.eschallenges.com. And, uh, and then, of course, there's the new Spike Prime, which I'll show you a few examples of as well. Most of the stuff we do, though, is really aimed at uh, what we call maximizing solution diversity. So we want to have as many different possible answers for the same problem. So, for example, this is a question of can you just walk, through, walk forward without uh, using wheels? And you can see that students were able to come up with many, many different ways of solving the problem. The, our, our contention is that uh, if there's one right answer to the problem, then what you're really testing is the student's ability to replicate your knowledge as opposed to think uh, for him or herself. And so a combination of both of those is important, we feel, within our classrooms. Uh, on the lower left, you can see this is a, uh, my class last semester where we had juniors and seniors at Tufts actually building different interfaces uh, for video games using the Spike Prime software and a wild terminal screen from Grove sensors uh, from Seed Studio. And then you also have uh, the ability to have robots uh, control puppets. So another class of mine uh, now a couple of years ago where they had to in some way show emotion from a puppet using a, a robot. And you can see there are many different ways that they came up with of doing that. So at this point, at the center, the way we bring are bringing robotics into the classroom is through giving students open-ended design challenges. And we found one of the most effective ways to actually start those off is through what we call placemats. And we have over 100 placemats available on our website. The link is right there. These are things from teaching uh, mathematics with going the distance or hidden letter to uh, teaching gearing with Lego spinning tops or just having fun in the fabrication side with a robot zoo. Each of these placemats has a number of different examples. You can see in the picture three examples. We found if you only showed one example, they would tend, students will tend to build that one. If you show two, they'll pick one. But if you show three, they'll start developing their own. And uh, we, we have different placemats depending on if you want to use the MicroPython or uh, the Scratch programming environment um, in each of these. And there's Spike Prime ones, there's EV3 ones, Arduino ones. In general, what we found is that different students progress differently through the activity. Some only read the first line of the directions and then they never touch the placemat again. Um, that's about uh, maybe 10 to 15 percent. Um, a bunch of them will actually go back and forth between the placemat and the and the system that uh, and the what they're building. There, you're talking closer to 30 percent, and then a bunch of them will actually read through the entire placemat. So it's interesting to see how the different students progress. There doesn't seem to be a correlation between how they use the placemat and the quality of the build at the end. It's just they have different ways of approaching the problem. 
So what is currently possible? Well, currently, there's a lot of robots on the market. Uh, with Some have uh, are integrated with uh, strong building systems. Some are pre-built robots. Some have a strong coding side, and some are pre-coded robots. Uh, so we've been looking at how can you find ones that allow solution diversity in both the coding side and the building side. Uh, they tend to cover a large uh, set of disciplines, all the engineering disciplines, STEM disciplines, even uh, there's a bunch of work with literacy and uh, robots as well. But the newest area is with artificial intelligence. And so if you, if you look at uh, AI for K12.org, uh, it's a group of, uh, of professors over here in the U.S. that have looked at, at where is the research world within AI happening, um, from looking at perception to reasoning to uh, computers actually learning from data to interacting naturally with humans and then of course the societal impact that they have. All these are, are strong research areas and we uh, are starting to see if we can take the results of these research and apply them uh, to the robotics world. So what does that then look like? Well uh, at the various sim uh, at the simplest level it could be by training your dog to sit or to stand uh, based on where you place your hand. And you can do that uh, certainly with writing your own code, but you can also do that by showing the dog numerous times what it means to, uh, to get the signal to sit and what it means to get the signal to stand. And so we will do that with k-means or uh, k-n-n type models. Uh, you can get a little bit more complicated with regression type models. So this is one of our favorite activities called uh, going the distance where you measure how far it goes in one second, you measure how far it goes in two seconds, you measure how far it goes in three seconds. Um, and then we would typically have the students build up a graph of how far the uh, car has gone, uh, and then use that graph to interpolate when I give you a distance, how long should you make your car go? And then we line up all the cars and we see who comes closest uh, to going the correct distance. We usually do that by putting a little Lego person at the distance and see who comes closest to kissing their Lego person. So in this case, you can see it trained itself, to, and then I told it to go exactly uh, uh, seven inches, and you can see indeed, or eight inches from the wall, and you can see indeed it did. And uh, so this is, it builds up that graph internally and then does a linear regression on that graph. You can also do that same problem, but do it with reinforcement learning. So go for a random distance and then build up a reward system based on the uh, distance between where you want to be and where you actually ended up. And so we currently have a system we're working with to see if we can teach uh, reinforcement learning to, to middle school kids through these kinds of activities where it might seem silly at first that, uh, uh, that you're going through all this work just to figure out how to calibrate your car, but then we can apply it to things like actually making a Lego robot that can walk. When we start getting into machine learning, uh, training becomes even more interesting when we start recognizing uh, things as complicated as images. So it's, it's almost impossible for a middle school student to write a Python code, C code, that would actually identify their face. It's quite straightforward for uh, that same student to train a robot to recognize its face. And in this case, you can even think about it coming towards you when it sees your face if you can integrate a camera into your robot. Using uh, powerful things like uh, machine learning, you can actually uh, start to teach it to recognize what you say as well. So Teachable Machines, if you haven't played there, I would highly recommend it. It's a very well laid out website where you can mess around with things where you can train it to actually recognize your voice uh, and as you're talking, you can see it tells you what it thinks you said, and of course you can make that control your robot. As we move into the training world, though, that brings up a whole slew of new issues of what, what we need to teach. Uh, so suddenly, instead of teaching uh, if, if statements and, and for loops, we're now teaching them how to train. So what is a, a reasonable training set size? Uh, what are the effects of backgrounds, lightings, and variations in the subject to whether or not your training is effective? It's no longer, if something doesn't work, debugging isn't going back into the code and seeing what's going on. Debugging now is looking at your training set and see, did you, did you get a, a diverse enough or a large enough training set? And of course, I'm sure you all are aware of all of the 
uh, latest things looking at training biases, especially with skin color um, or face shape. And uh, the training sets don't include, for instance, uh, people of color, then it's not going to, then the final machine learning algorithm is not going to do a good job at recognizing those faces. So where are we going with all of this? Well, one of the things we've gotten really excited about is uh, what we call the idea of a smart motor. So imagine a motor that you can just train. So no computers or anything. You just put the motor to the position you want for a given light. You know, see, you hit the button a couple of times to read a few light sensor readings. The light sensor is right on top there. So maybe now you move it to a different position, cover the light sensor, and take a couple more readings. And now every time you cover the light sensor, it'll know where to turn. So now it's trained, and I can just move the, the motor to whatever position I want by covering the light sensor, which means I can play games like this, um, or I can make more complicated dioramas like this. Uh, this is a video made by hey one this of the people that work at, works at Tufts. And the story of Punxsutawney Phil, the groundhog, is that when it's really bright and sunny outside, uh, he casts a shadow and he's so scared that he gets afraid of his shadow and he runs down back into his hole and burrows and sleeps and doesn't bring spring for another six weeks. But if it happens to be cloudy on Groundhog Day, uh, Phil will pop up out of his hole and decide that it's he doesn't see his shadow so it's time to go explore the woods and bring springtime to everybody. So I'm going to train my robot to do that. So <laughs> So she goes through a similar okay. training. Oh, so it's sunny outside. Phil went away. But if it gets cloudy, oh, Phil pops up. And if it's sunny, he pops back down. Oh, but he'll come up when it's cloudy. And that's the story of Punxsutawney Phil, the groundhog who's afraid of his shadow. So you can imagine now the opportunities that are available to, uh, to kids, even at very young ages, where they can build interactive uh, dioramas um, through training rather than through coding. So what will computer science look like in 20 years? I honestly have no idea, but I can't believe that it won't include a large, of train, a large set of trainable systems moving away from writing code and moving more into uh, telling the robot what to do in some way and having the robot react. There are really exciting things happening in the, in the teachable machines world of recognizing what you say or your pose or your face. There's uh, spatial programming, this augmented reality. You take out your phone and you point to where you want the robot to go. Um, and then, of course, any of the Siri or Alexa talking to the robot uh, and all the Internet of Things. So, uh, so what, what really is going to happen in the next 20 years, we uh, clearly don't know. Uh, but, but it would seem that to, we really have to think critically about how we want to structure the classroom to bring in this new world of training of how do, how do we get how do we talk to computers how do we interact with computers and machine learning uh, so that we can have uh, students even young students doing fairly complicated things like um, recognizing your face or being able to understand what you say so thank you very much and I would be happy to answer any questions I either here now or later on uh, you can always reach me through my email which is just crogers at tufts.edu thank you very much